So the, the goal of the um, lecture today is to understand the epidemiology and staging system of lung cancer. So I'll try to cover both non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer, uh, starting with small cell first. So a lung cancer um, is common, and um, in terms of new cases in this year, uh, it is expected to uh, be around uh, 230,000 uh, in the United States. Uh, in terms of mortality from lung cancer this year uh, alone, we will see about uh, 130,000 deaths uh, related to lung cancer. And one of the reasons why lung cancer is such a poor mortality is because a lot of patients, when they present, uh, they, pre they present with um, uh, distant metastasis and also uh, uh, regionally uh, advanced disease. And five-year um, uh, survival, uh, this is sorry, this is a typo, it's the stage four, uh, five-year reverse survival is 6.3%, as you can see on the graph here, not 56.3, and that's our goal <laughs> for, for the future, uh, but 6.3% five-year reverse survival. Uh, the data is actually from SEER database, and then this is coming from uh, year 2011 and 2017, and as you know, and I'll go over uh, the advances, hopefully, you know, we'll see different numbers, improved numbers in terms of five-year survival going forward. How about that worldwide? So, um, uh, so worldwide, we'll have about 2.2 million new cases per year, and then about 1.8 million deaths uh, due to lung cancer per year. And it is the leading cause of cancer deaths uh, if you look at the sort of worldwide cancer mortality data. And so here, the lung cancer is color coded in blue, and you can see that the regions where you see uh, uh, the higher rates of uh, lung cancer mortality uh, uh, divided by uh, women and, and men. So what are the risk factors? So uh, we know a lot about cigarette smoking, but that's not the, sort of the only thing that can cause lung cancer. And a lot of times we don't know, and I have now many, many patients in my pr practice uh, who didn't smoke or didn't really have any risk factors, but then still developing lung cancer. Um, so cigarette smoking, but you know, it has been well established as a uh, risk factor for lung cancer, and that includes secondhand smoking. And we talk about the asbestos, radon, uh, the gas, and then uh, it's a burning of the coal and wood and the smoking smoke from there. And air pollution has been looked at quite uh, extensively. And if you have a pulmonary disease, uh, such as pulmonary fibrosis, COPD, TB, uh, things like this, then you, you, know, you have a higher risk of developing lung cancer. And uh, genomic predisposition has not been well understood, but there are certainly a, a families uh, where uh, you know, lung cancer happened more commonly than, than other um, and other families, uh, but you know, we are, our understanding um, will be improved with the more studies on, on this uh, on this topic. And then, you know, we, we talk about the uh, oncogenic viruses, uh, including HIV infection, and you know, with HIV infection, your risk of any cancer uh, essentially goes up, uh, including lung cancer. But uh, lung cancer is not ACE-defining cancer, as you all know. So uh, we can screen uh, for lung cancer, and there were two randomized clinical trials showing a reduction in lung cancer mortality. And so the first trial that was published was NLST. Now this was published about 10 years ago, pretty big study with uh, 53,000 patients. And patients were randomized either to annual low dose CT screening versus chest uh, uh, radiographs over a period of three years. And then what it showed was that there was a 20% reduction in their lung cancer mortality with a significant hazard um, p-value. There was also an uh, overall survival benefit. They saw 6.7% uh, improvement in overall survival. Uh, Nelson trial is, was conducted in Europe, a smaller study compared with NLST, but pretty large. And then they added the sort of subgroup of um, you know, women in the study. Uh, and then the intervention was low dose uh, CT versus no intervention. Uh, and then the timing of those um, CAT scans were a baseline and then four more scans over a period of 15 years. And then uh, showed a uh, similar to NLST showed a 24% uh, reduction uh, in the risk of lung cancer mortality. So now we have two randomized trials showing the lung cancer uh, mortality benefit, but then the uptake was not great. Uh, and we're, we're trying to improve that. So, uh, so Dr. Yeah. Kim, the role in that trial, you had to be a smoker, right? Like there had to be a high. Oh risk. yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so you have to smoker, and then you have to have um, sort of risk factors for that. And 
Um, it is sort of somewhat narrow, um, uh, you know, eligibility criteria because you need to, you know, um, have smoked uh, quite a bit in order to be eligible. But then we see a lot of nowadays uh, lung cancers and never smokers and light um, smokers. And then how to address those populations is really a challenge. And there are some trials ongoing, but then I think there should be a bigger effort perhaps uh, including not just CT scan, but maybe like blood tests like CT DNA and other things. Uh, you know, I think that those are those are the things people are looking into at this point. Uh, that is right. And then there is a you know recent uh, probably expansion of the eligibility criteria for the uh, low dose CT screening from the uh, you know U.S. Uh, Prevention Task Force, and I think you're all aware of that. Uh, so 85% of uh, lung cancers um, are non-small cell lung cancer and adenocarcinoma being the most common type of lung cancer and certainly adenocarcinoma is the most common type of lung cancer that I see in our clinical, clinical practice and then followed by squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, small cell lung cancer uh, consists of about 15% of all lung cancer cases. Uh, and we look at T and N and M um, scoring uh, or, or staging system and T pertains to the primary mass, what's the size, and whether it involves any uh, you know, surrounding organs, and is nodal staging, and how many lymph nodes that we see involved, and what are the locations of the lymph nodes. So that determines T and M, and then M means a metastasis. So if you have one um, uh, lesion, let's say in plural-based, uh, and that gives you uh, M1A disease, if you have a single extrathoracic organ metastasis, it's M1B, get multiple uh, metastases outside of the, uh, uh, and you know, in the different organs that, that becomes M1C. And then staging is uh, very important. I don't recommend to you, um, uh, I'm not saying that you should remember uh, all, all the details because I can't, and I always look at the, the chart that I have, uh, you know, during the whole board, but certainly uh, staging drives a lot of our treatment decisions um, when we take care for a patient with lung cancer. Uh, so I'm, I'm a medical oncologist, so I do drug therapy, uh, to uh, simply put. And so there are three types of lung cancer therapies. So one is chemotherapy. We all know what chemo is. It essentially kills the fast-growing cells. And, um, and there, you know, we hope to kill the sort of fast-growing tumor cells. But then, as you can imagine, there are sort of fast-growing cells in the body, like, you know, GI system and then, you know, hair follicles bone marrow and they can get hit from chemotherapy. Um, but you know, chemotherapy has been with us for many decades now and we still use it, uh, effective therapy in, uh, in many scenarios. Uh, target therapy uh, was developed about 20 years ago and then uh, we, we have a lot of now target therapy oral, usually these are oral drugs, but not always. There are some IV versions of target therapy, usually oral drugs that really interferes with the specific uh, signaling pathway of uh, tumor cells. And immunotherapy has really um, transformed the treatment landscape of lung cancer. And you are familiar with PD-1, PD-1 inhibitor therapy and CTLA-4 therapy as well. So I will go over some of the details uh, in the next uh, uh, talk of my slides. So chemotherapy, you know, you, you see some of the examples of chemotherapy, you know, carboplatin, cisplatin, those are platin-based chemo. And then uh, one of the commonly used uh, chemo is called the uh, Pemetrex set for lung adenocarcinoma. And this taxol can be used for both these technologies. And then these are the examples of some of the target therapy drugs. And then these are usually oral drugs, but then there's our IV version uh, recently added to our uh, treatment tools. Uh, but, you know, the target therapies are only possible if the patient has a uh, you know, tumor is harboring certain mutations or sort of genomic alterations. Uh, so this is not so this is not for everybody. Uh, your your tumor needs to have certain features. Uh, immunotherapy um, does not kill tumor cells directly, but it's uh, more of an indirect way of uh, treating cancer. Um, you know, if you think about the immune system, it really wraps up the sort of immune uh, immune activity against cancer cells. Um, and so, but the one of the beauty of the immunotherapy is that uh, it can induce uh, quite durable responses in, in those a uh, small number of patients who really benefit a lot from the treatment. And, you know, I have several patients now who are off immunotherapy. One patient started um, immunotherapy clinical trial uh, in 2015, uh, stopped the therapy because of side effects. She's still around. She's not on any therapy. Um, she may be cured. Uh, we don't know exactly. 
um, you know, but you know, after six years after stage four diagnosis, no therapy is required for the patient. So you know, there are a very small number of patients who may be cured with the immunotherapy, even in the setting of stage four disease. Um, and that is our uh, speculation, but um, you know, we need more time uh, to figure that out. Um, so as you can see in this uh, timeline um, sort of uh, figure, you can see that there are a lot more drugs added to our tools for treatment of lung cancer. And so this has been really exciting field. So let's say 20 years ago, you come, you know, see a doctor for lung cancer. The only thing you will be offered, you, you know, uh, you would have been, uh, been offered was chemotherapy. And, you know, there was various chemotherapy regimens, but not more than that. But now we have uh, as I mentioned, target therapy and immunotherapy and some combination of everything. And so uh, the, the field is expanding and advancing quite a lot. And I think we'll see at some point in the next five to 10 years, like cell therapy uh, based lung cancer treatment. And I think they'll be integrating our uh, treatment uh, paradigm for lung cancer at some point. So let's talk about small cell lung cancer. And because I think you know, small cell lung cancer is something you're gonna see and you're gonna have some patients in the hospital uh, who um, will be admitted with a lot of symptoms. And so again, small cell lung cancer is about 15% of all lung cancer cases. And uh, the, the diagram here showing uh, the mutation targets that we see uh, with the lung adenocarcinoma on the left. So we have a lot of targets for non-small cell lung cancer. On the right, we don't have any targeted therapy for lung cancer. We still rely on chemotherapy. Recently, immunotherapy was added to chemotherapy as first-line therapy, but uh, we need to do more uh, for small cell lung cancer, certainly an unknown need. Uh, again, 15% of lung cancers are small cell, and it's highly correlated with smoking. But if you look at the, um, the large database, there's a certain number of patients who, uh, who uh, were diagnosed with small cell lung cancer, about 1.8%, and they're um, uh, behavior is likely different from uh, those uh, small cell lung cancer rising in uh, smokers. Um, I found that this is a little interesting data. Uh, overall instance of small cell lung cancer is declining likely because of smoking rate is going down. And um, this is a, a WHO classification of neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and so you, we have small cell lung cancer and there, there can be a, some, some mixed histology uh, between small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. A large cell neuro, neuroendocrine carcinoma is a, a type of neuroendocrine carcinoma. It is rarer than small cell lung cancer. It's like a one or 2% of lung cancer cases. Uh, so these are sort of uh, high grade uh, aggressive neuroendocrine carcinomas. Um, we have carcinoid tumors, and these are uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So these are not carcinomas. Uh, and you know, there we have typical carcinoid and atypical carcinoid. They behave much better than um, the uh, small cell lung cancer, large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And if you look at the cells under the microscope, the pathologist can give you diagnosis in a, in a second, actually, because the characteristics of the cells um, are, are very uh, typical. So you know, they have a lot of uh, you know, big uh, nucleus uh, and nucleoli, uh, uh, and not, uh, not nucleoli, but the, you know, big nucleus with, uh, with, without um, you know, a lot of cytoplasm. And then if you look at KI67 rate, then it's usually high and necrosis is common because they like to grow very fast. And you see uh, small blue cells uh, about uh, twice the size of lymphocytes and you can make the diagnosis based on this. And uh, there are some tumor markers, you know, pathologists uh, sometimes used to really to make sure that we're dealing with a small cell lung cancer. And these are so TTF1 and synaptophysin, chromogranin, CD56, and these are the markers, IHC markers you're, you're gonna see on the report. Uh, so I told you that there's not a lot of um, targets uh, in small cell lung cancer and um, our understanding, however, our understanding uh, has been improving in the last few years thanks to uh, deeper genomic analysis. Now, you know, people look at so transcriptional uh, pattern of small cell and can differentiate the uh, subtypes uh, based on the uh, sort of gene expression patterns. And as, as you can see here in this, um, uh, in this figure. And this is a research I was involved in, you uh, know, in research arising from uh, NIH. And then here we show that uh, small cell lung cancer may have an inherited predisposition. And you can see, you know, family uh, members, uh, family sort of pedigree uh, with a lot of small cell lung cancers. And then um, in this particular family on the right, they found uh, you know, mutation in the, uh, in the germline. Um, and the gene called, uh, you know, MUT, 
uh, y h. And so this is interesting because you know previously we thought that small cell lung cancer happens only in smokers and period, but then our understanding is uh, is advancing with more research. So you will see patients, uh, you know, at some point in, during your career uh, onwards. And uh, I mean, these patients present sometimes with a lot of symptoms because their disease is bulky. As you can see, a lot of lymph node involvement and then a big mass. Uh, and patients can have cough, a shortness of breath, weight loss, and, and other symptoms. One of the high yield board questions uh, for internal medicine is the perineoplastic syndrome. Uh, from small cell lung cancer. And uh, if you look at some data, the Lambert Eaton syndrome can happen in about um, 3 to 4 percent of patients. And this is uh, this involves the antibody uh, against the uh, presynaptic calcium channels of the neuromuscular junction. And 95 percent of them uh, are the PQ type uh, voltage gated calcium channels of the antibody. And then so uh, there you get, um, you have proximal muscle weakness that improves with the repeated use. This is the uh, characteristics of lambert eaton syndrome uh, in small cell lung cancer. Um, and you know, you can have sensory neuropathy. And actually I had one patient who developed the sensory neuropathy even before her diagnosis of small cell lung cancer. Um, and she didn't have any, any other risk factors such as uh, you know, diabetes or other medication use. And so that could be a uh, first presenting symptom of small cell lung cancer. And you can have personality change or mental status change if you have a sort of CNS involvement like limbic encephalopathy. Um, and so that, but that's pretty rare, 1.5% of patients. And then you can see that the examples of uh, neuronal antibodies involved in uh, perineoplastic uh, syndrome. And then other per perineoplastic syndromes include endocrinology problems uh, such as uh, ACTH causing uh, Cushing syndrome and uh, SIH which is very, very common in small cell lung cancer. So your sodium level goes down um, and that is because of the, uh, the vasopressin uh, excretion from the, the cells. Uh, about one third of patients are limited stage uh, and here we define limited stage as um, sort of disease that can be encompassed within a single radiation port, but a lot um, you know, more commonly we see patients with extensive stage where um, the radiation uh, field uh, sort of extends beyond the single port uh, field. And then these patients require systemic therapy, um, uh, most uh, likely chemotherapy. If they're in the hospital, an outpatient, we use a chemotherapy and immunotherapy combination. I'll show you later why. For a limited stage small cell lung cancer, we use the combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And so four cycles of chemo uh, and the radiation therapy is given over six weeks or so. And here we use cisplatin and toposide. Uh, carbo can be used if the patient cannot receive cisplatin. Uh, and the small cell lung cancer is a little uh, different from other cancers where you can have a lot of um, um, a higher rate of uh, brain metastasis, even if you, uh, present with the limited stage initially. So there was a study looking at um, prophylactic radiation of the brain after uh, treatment with key initial chemo radiation therapy, and it showed uh, in this meta-analysis uh, over a survival benefit. So uh, it is still the standard of care to uh, prophylactically radiate the brain after uh, initial chemo radiation. And so this is something I discussed with my patients. Um, if, you, if the patient um, has extensive stage small cell lung cancer, let's say um, you know, they are not a candidate for radiation because of the field is large, or if they have uh, distant metastasis, uh, then uh, we think about using systemic therapy first, and uh, we use uh, the combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Here we have two regimens approved, and the first regimen here, carboitol plus atezolizumab, actually was originated from Georgetown uh, here at Lombardi. Uh, as an investigator initial trial, then you know became a, a sort of randomized phase three worldwide trial and showed over a sort of benefit. And Dr. Liu uh, sort of led the trial here. And so in Power 133 trial compared uh, chemotherapy plus atezolizumab. So atezolizumab is anti pdl one inhibitor, and this was compared with the chemotherapy alone, which was at the at the, at the time a standard of care, and showed over a survival benefit. And the hazard ratio was 0.7. So there was 30% improvement, a reduction in the risk of death if you received the combination versus chemotherapy alone. 
And so this was a re pretty remarkable, and now the study was uh, published three years ago. Now this has became our center of care for our patients. In the hospital, though, it is very difficult to give immunotherapy. Immunotherapy drugs are super expensive, not covered when the patient is in the hospital. So you will see uh, patients only getting uh, chemotherapy uh, in the hospital, but then when they are discharged, then we always add uh, immunotherapy like uh, tizolizumab um, so that they can get the chemo-immunotherapy combination. Uh, another similar trial, they use a the chemotherapy plus their valumab. So this is another PDL1 inhibitor, it's an immunotherapy immune checkpoint inhibitor. And this was compared, I'm sorry, this was a typo. Uh, this is compared with the chemotherapy alone in extensive say, small cell lung cancer. And then there was overall survival benefit. So there was 27% reduction in the risk of death if you used uh, chemo IO versus chemotherapy alone. So le leading to FD approval. Um, so this is a second regimen that, that we can use. But uh, you know, we don't use both because you know, we pick one and these are both approved for first line. So, um, so, so uh, per the choice of doctor, uh, treating doctor, but um, you know, here we use the uh, physiolism and chemotherapy combination a lot because again, you know, because of the drug development history here. Um, we really don't do a lot of uh, prophylactic brain radiation for ex extensive say, small cell lung cancer. So this was a standard of care actually many years ago based on the, you know, this European EORTC trial showing, uh, you know, uh, somewhat uh, modest improvement in the overall survival, 6.7 versus 5.4 months. So in this trial, a patient received chemotherapy, finished the treatment, and then randomized to receive prophylactic brain radiation versus observation, and then showed some benefit. But then the criticism about this clinical trial was that brain imaging was not part of um, standard staging or, or um, a baseline. So, you know, you can imagine that some patients actually might have had some brain meds kind of linger, um, some hiding in the brain, and then sort of some of them were included in this trial. So there was a Japanese trial published four years ago now. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Can I ask you to back two slides? Uh, yeah, so in looking at this one, if I look at the second graph, yep. would it be fair to say that, you know, adding in the, um, the immune checkpoint inhibitor gives benefit to like 20% of the group? That's right. Yeah. So not everybody um, benefits from the treatment and we don't know which patient. If you benefit, it's a good thing, but. Exactly. So you can see the over. That is absolutely right. If you look at the Kaplan micro for over survival, there is absolutely no difference right here. But yeah. then if you are past the uh, six months time period, there are some long term survivors who experience a benefit from them. Uh, in immunotherapy, and these are the patients who uh, really drives the benefit. And at this point, we don't have any sort of predictive tools to say that this patient will benefit from immunotherapy-based approach versus not. So we treat everybody with the chemo immunotherapy at this point. Uh, but now, you know, I show you some sort of gene expression data. Now uh, we understand a little more about which patient may have sort of inflamed phenotype in the tumor microenvironment. So uh, our understanding is getting a little more sophisticated, but we are not there yet to say that, you know, this patient should get immunotherapy or not. So your observation is correct. correct. Um, so for extensive stage based on this Japanese trial, we don't really recommend um, sort of prophylactic brain radiation if the patient has extensive stage disease. And as you can see, if you look at this uh, curve, so um, if you receive brain radiation, your curve is on the, uh, uh, under the observation curve, actually. So, um, so this is worrisome. Uh, and so uh, the difference between the European uh, study, the older study uh, versus the study was that in this trial, they uh, made sure that everybody got brain MRI before they randomized patients. So if the patient had brain meds in this trial, they were not included in this trial. So they only include patients who didn't have brain meds and they show that you know, brain uh, prof uh, prevention brain, brain radiation is not a good thing for these patients. But you still need to um, you know, monitor the patients given the very high risk of brain metastasis uh, you know, at uh, using MRI uh, serially. Uh, second line, very tough. Not a lot of patients even can get like second line chemotherapy for you know, extensive say, small cell lung cancer. Um, and median over survival with the recurrent small cell lung cancer is measured, you know, in months, like four to five months, and you can see how poor that is. So, um, but, you know, there was a study that compared the topodecan versus no treatment, and then there was a definitely a survival benefit. Um, you know, this study um, sort of supports the use of chemotherapy in this setting, 
However, it's not a not home run as you can see. You know, a lot of patients die. Um, and the topotecan was compared with three drug regimen uh, you know, a long time ago and showed that the topotecan, so monotherapy can improve symptoms uh, uh, from small cell lung cancer. And that was the basis of the FDA approval for topotecan. Now we have another option called erbinectidine. And so this is, um, uh, you know, the study was done in Europe, uh, not a huge study, 100 patients. And then what it showed was that, you know, we can induce uh, response using this drug. This is alkylating chemotherapy. Uh, in uh, you know about 35% of patients, so this is my now uh, second line therapy chemotherapy. Um, not a lot of patients can get third line chemo or fourth line. Very very rare because their performance status goes pretty uh, quickly down uh, as their you know, disease progresses. And um, so there is uh, you know a lot more uh, studies we need to do for our patients with the small cell lung cancer. Um, you know, people look at nowadays uh, you know, cell therapy by specific antibodies. So there are uh, newer therapies uh, on the horizon, actually, which is good. Now, uh, uh, stage four non-small cell lung cancer. And so, um, you know, these are the uh, target therapy drugs and immunotherapy drugs for um, approved for advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer. And if, you, if I, you know, um, had made this slide like 10 years ago, let's say 20 years ago, uh, the list would include no therapy because there's no uh, target therapy or immunotherapy at the time approved for lung cancer. And so there is a lot of nihilism about lung cancer. Let's say 20, 30 years ago, oh, you get chemotherapy, you live about a year and a year or year and a half. And, you know, a lot of patients die, uh, you know, after chemotherapy. But now we see long-term survivors, uh, even in the setting of stage four disease. And so that's why we are, we remain very, very hopeful. Uh, and so uh, the... Uh, so there's a lot of targets. So there's, uh, you know, we look at each of our all grass one and things like that. You know, you don't need to memorize all, all this, but then uh, whenever I see a new patient in my clinic, the first thing I think about is, is the patient have any target therapy option? Because what we know is that, you know, these target therapies can really make a big difference in their quality of life and are even survival a lot of times. So uh, we think about, um, that so that is the first question I ask myself. You know, does this patient have target therapy options? Uh, and how do we know? We we sequence their tumor, so we look at their DNA and RNA, and also we send their blood. Like this is called blood biopsy or liquid biopsy to understand their genomic profiles of tumor. And so uh, it is very important to do the proper testing to understand what options the patient has before you sort of you know jump on and and start the patient on some you know, treatment. Uh, there are cases where patients are sick need to start chemotherapy or some sort of uh, therapy, then, you know, we start chemotherapy first while we wait for uh, the testing results. Uh, but, uh, you know, we try our best to expedite the, the, the testing for, for molecular analysis. Any questions from anyone? I think I um, and then, you know, the bottom bullet point, and it has immunotherapy uh, drugs approved for lung cancer. So we have uh, six drugs approved for immunotherapy. So every um, uh, most of the drugs are PD-1, PD-1 inhibitor therapy. There is one drug, uh, CTLA-4 inhibitor. And so again, this, these are immune checkpoint inhibitor therapies. Uh, and then you know, you're going to see patients receiving these therapies. And also you're going to see patients who will develop side effects uh, from, from this treatment, like autoimmune um, sort of disorders. And so how do we choose therapy? And this is more for like fellows, but then we, uh, one of the most important things is that, you know, molecular profiles of the tumor. So what is your PA1 status? What is their sort of genomic alteration status? And that is really the first thing I ask myself. And well, of course we look at histology, is it adenocarcinoma? Adenocarcinoma has more chance to have targets than squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, and um, lastly, we need to look at the patient, you know, is the patient strong enough to get therapy uh, what are their sort of comorbidities like heart disease or, or renal function and all that. And patient's preference also plays a very important role when we choose therapy. Uh, and so this is a, uh, I think I showed this already in a couple of slides before. Then you know, if you look at a patient with lung adenocarcinoma, um, now we have a lot of targets we can use to uh, we can use drugs to target actually. And so this is a series from Memorial Sloan Carey in New York. Uh, they looked at about uh, 806 patients and show that this is sort of the, uh, the frequency of uh, each mutation uh, or genomic alteration. And, um, uh, you know, 10 years ago, there, was, there were not a lot of drugs we can target um, uh, to use to target these things. But then now with the, the list of the drugs that have been approved and also are in, in clinical investigation, 
uh, is really expanding rapidly. So we, we are able to target more and more of these uh, genomic alterations these days. Um, I briefly mentioned the uh, liquid biopsy, and then you sometimes see in our notes, you know, console note, notes saying, you know, if you have a patient with lung cancer stage four, uh, you know, we are going to send CT DNA or liquid biopsy to understand the genomic alterations of the tumor. And, you know, that is uh, really uh, standard practice these days and uh, getting more integrated. And then if you think about how this works is that, you know, as the tumors grow, they can die, they can release their genomic um, material like DNA or RNA. And by checking the patient's blood, you can pick up the genomic alteration, you know, in their DNA or RNA. So uh, liquid biopsy has been mostly uh, focused on DNA, but then now we are testing RNA fusion in blood so that with the technology, um, technology of advancement, uh, we are able to pick up more and uh, a more variety of uh, our targets in, in patient's blood. And uh, unlike the tissue-based uh, uh, next generation sequencing, the blood biopsy or liquid biopsy comes back in about a week, uh, which can be very helpful to uh, when we make a, a decision for, for our patients. Uh, just to spend uh, uh, some time for each of our you know, lung cancer, and this is uh, one of the uh, most frequent driver mutation in non-small cell lung cancer. It can happen in any part of the world, but the more commonly in, the, in Asians uh, versus uh, or, uh, Caucasian. And then the most common mutations are exon 19 deletion and LA58R mutation. And why do I mention this is because this really opened the target therapy field for whole solid oncology. And so the gene was identified many years ago, several decades, but then um, in about 20 years ago, there was first approval uh, of erlotinib, which is first generation EGFR TKI, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Um, and at the time, we didn't know what were the predictors of the responsiveness to EGFR ty tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy. Uh, same year, 2004, there were three papers came out and saying that, oh, you need to have EGFR mutations uh, in DNA to have a response to you know, one of these drugs. And so really, these three papers opened the whole field of target therapy for solid oncology. Um, and so what they did was that, so this is one of the papers, NEJ paper 2004. Um, they had a clinical trial using a drug called Jepetinib, another first-gen drug. Um, and then they collected patient sample at the time, and not a lot of samples, as you can see in the list. And all these patients, nine patients, had uh, uh, similar or same mutations in, the, in their tumor, so EGFR mutations. And they proved that, you know, um, by looking at these uh, the patient tumor samples, um, that, you know, the EGFR mutations were the predictor of the response. So, you know, if you run a clinical trial, I always emphasize to patients that you need to collect samples from patients like tumor or blood to understand what really predicts the, the outcomes of the treatment, because that's the way uh, the field, um, you know, has been sort of moving forward. The science drives the, the clinical care and treatment. Interesting that patient number nine didn't have the mutation but had an extended response. Yeah, oh, very good observation. So, I mean, at the time, 2004, the, um, uh, it was likely that their um, genomic testing uh, ability cap capacity was pretty limited, like based on like Sanger sequencing. Um, and so there are a lot of other EGFR mutations that are sensitive to EGFR TK therapy. So I bet the patient probably had one of the rare ones that could not be detected using Sanger or you know, PCR-based testing, actually. Um, yeah, but, but very good observation. Um, and so now we have five drugs. And so you, know, you can see this is type of the response that you see. And so this is a patient that I took care of uh, you know, when I was a fellow at NIH. Uh, six-year female, uh, never a smoker, was found to have EGFR mutation, and then the patient was started on uh, one of the first-gen drugs. You can see pretty dramatic response, uh, and then, you know, even after two months of therapy. And so all these drugs can induce pretty good response rate, and about, uh, if you can see here, the last column, you see the response rate um, is about 60 to 80 percent. So this is much, much higher than chemotherapy alone, which is measured, you know, between 15 to, you know, 30 something percent up to 40 percent. So really double the, the chance of uh, uh, yielding uh, really significant tumor shrinkage. And then there was a benefit in terms of progression-free survival in these uh, randomized clinical trials that compared EGFR, tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy and chemotherapy. So uh, these trials really uh, led to our sort of current practice where we use the EGFR-TKI first for these patients, uh, not really chemotherapy. 
And then five drugs, now we have like third generation drug called um, osimertinib. And then this drug is much better tolerated than all the other uh, prior generation drugs. Uh, very well tolerated and it has a, a superior uh, CNS uh, penetration. Uh, because you know when, when, when you have lung cancer, lung cancer has a um, tendency to uh, have a brain metastasis. So it is very important to develop drugs that can have activity in the, in the brain. And so Asmertin does that and it has been the winner uh, in, when, when it was compared with the first generation um, drugs in this clinical trial called FLORA trial. So the median PFS uh, progression for free survival was 19 months with osmeritinib versus 10 months. So there was about uh, nine months or 8.7 months benefit in terms of median PFS with osmeritinib. And then the overall survival so panned out uh, nicely. So uh, you know I told you that if you had a stage four lung cancer, say 20 years ago after chemo, the patient lived about a one year. Uh, one year and one year and a half. And in this trial, the overall survival they saw was 38.6 uh, months with osmertinib. And so more than three years, which is remarkable if you think about you know, how poor the outcomes were you know, 20 years ago with the chemotherapy. Uh, there, the, the target therapies are not, the, um, are not uh, able to cure disease and you know, various mechanisms and res resistance uh, happen and despite initial very nice response. And you know, it can include um, uh, all, uh, activation of secondary source signaling pathway or some fusion events or even like histological transformation such as non-small cell uh, to uh, transform into like small cell lung cancer, things like that. So uh, at that time, you know, we need to understand what are the drivers of resistance and that can sometimes help uh, figure out what is the uh, best treatment for that patient. And then uh, this is a research I was involved in, same theme here. So, you know, patients can develop various uh, resistance mechanisms uh, of resistance. Um, ALK um, is rarer than EGFR, but it is remarkable because these patients, if you look at some of the retrospective data, even in the setting of stage four disease, the outcomes have been you know, improving a lot. And there are some reports saying median over survival is now reproaching seven to eight years with even uh, stage four disease. And so um, this gene uh, is a fusion event um, and then was first identified in lung cancer uh, in 2007 by a group of Japanese researcher. At the time, they analyzed a surgical specimen from, I think, a 60-something-year-old male and then identify this fusion event in the tumor, and then they implanted the cells that were harboring that the ALK fusion and show that in mice, uh, all these uh, uh, cells uh, harboring ALK fusion uh, was, uh, were, were able to uh, you know, form, form tumors, as you can see here. And so uh, like EGFR, we have five drugs for ALK at this point. And then we have first gen, second gen, third gen, all, all great options. It's probably more effective than EGFR, osmertinib. And if you look at the sort of PFS and over survival data, um, and how, uh, this is uh, one of the first gener generation drug called crizatinib. And then it had a pretty good response rate and you know, leading to approval by FDA now a uh, long time ago. You can see here in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the figure that uh, the patient had a pretty good response and all, all, all the disease sort of went away with this treatment in this particular patient. And so this is a type of response you can see with target therapy actually because um, if patients feel great even after a couple of days of treatment and then you can see response pretty fast and that's why it is important to identify the target and start the right therapy for, for the patient. And uh, so after initial crizotinib approval, now we have a better drugs um, such as uh, second generation drug alectinib compared with crizotinib, it showed a, um, a better survival in terms of PFS and also a CNS activity was much, much better than crizotinib. Um, and then, so this is the figure, um, you know, that when, when they look at the overall survival with the stage four disease, uh, the median survival was not uh, reached with alectinib and with the crizotinib, patient lived about, um, you know, seven months more than four years close to like uh, five years and so uh, we are talking about pretty long-term survival um, in, in these patients even in the setting of stage four disease. Uh, Brigantinib, another second line option again pretty similar to electinib data uh, pretty good response rate uh, better CNS activity to compare with crisotinib so uh, this is uh, again another set, first line option. Uh, I'll skip this. And the third generation drug called lorlatinib was compared with crisotinib, showing very impressive data, 
uh, although the side effect profile um, is a little unique. Uh, and can, can cause uh, mood disorders and neurologic symptoms. Uh, but you know, if you look at the uh, tumor efficacy data, it's very impressive. The hedgehog ratio for this is progression over death at the PFS was 0.27. So what this means is that there was 72% um, reduction in the risk of uh, disease progression over death if you took lorlatinib first uh, as opposed to grisatin first. And then not a lot of patients had a CNS um, uh, progression with the lorlatinib compared with the grisatin, as you can see. So uh, all good options, you know, here um, I use electinib a lot first line because I can say I can use electinib as second line therapy, uh, but then all these three drugs are all good options. And these are all oral drugs actually you take so one, uh, once or twice a day uh, and until um, the, the drug uh, loses its efficacy. And other targets, uh, you know, there's ROS1 infusion, this is about 1% and there are two drugs approved, resotinib and attractinib and BRAF V600E uh, non-small cell lung cancer. And so, so this is a, a plot called um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, showing the, the response rate. So you know, anything uh, below the zero uh, axis, uh, you know, you're seeing tumor reduction. In some patients, you see 100% reduction, meaning that you know, everything they were measuring in terms of target lesions are, are, are gone, actually. And so another target is called Madaxon 14. We have two oral drugs uh, called capmatinib, tapotinib. And then for red fusion positive lung cancer, we have two drugs, oral drugs, salpercatinib, prostatinib. And then for entractinib, uh, fusion positive tumors, we have two drugs, as you can see, that are tractinib and tractinib. Uh, recently, there was approval of um, another target therapy, oral drug called sovaracin for KRC12C mutant non small cell lung cancer. Um, the objective response rate is not as impressive uh, as other uh, as compared with other drugs, but you know this is first approval for KRAS uh, mutated non-small cell lung cancer uh, with a pretty good durable um, you know uh, duration of response uh, approaching one year, and so this is a pretty good option. But this is only approved for a second line setting and beyond. And so this is a, a patient, 25 year old. I saw him. Uh, several years ago, he was the youngest patient with stage 4 disease. He was not a smoker. He used some marijuana during college. That was it. And then developed the cough and was found to have stage 4 disease. And he received the chemoimmunotherapy, which is standard care, then progressed right through the chemoimmunotherapy, two cycles of treatment. And so we did the sequencing of the patient um, and the ctDNA, the liquid biopsy, picked up a mutation in HER2 gene or HER2 axon 20 mutation. And then we did a tissue ingest and then confirmed the mutation. So this is before the, um, so, and he entered a, uh, a clinical trial at the time. And so you see pretty large infiltrating the white lung, a lot of effusion, you see adrenal gland bilaterally. And then uh, he entered a clinical trial and received the drug called tar Tarlux. And you see that, you know, after two uh, cycles of treatment, oh no, this is after one cycle of treatment. So everything sort of melted away. You can see the infiltrate gone, infusion gone, adrenal gland mats are, are now sort of gone. Uh, and same thing was seen in the cycle four day one scan. Uh, the, the response didn't last too long though, um, about, uh, five months, I want to say, uh, of treatment, clinical trial. Um, uh, you know, he developed the, uh, the resistance and, and uh, progression, and he went on to receive all um, more lines of therapy, uh, probably six or seven lines, and received uh, a few months ago, he passed away, unfortunately, at the age of 28. Um, so immunotherapy, uh, I will spend maybe five minutes going a little fast. So, so immunotherapy, immune checkpoint um, uh, inhibitor therapy, essentially has been integra integrated with the lung cancer care uh, in, the, in the past few years. And what it does is that it really takes the, uh, the break off of the immune system. So it wraps up the immune system to fight uh, cancer better. Uh, that it's, um, it, it, uh, it, it's how it works. And then the most uh, notable sort of therapy that we have is uh, targeting PD-1, pd one pathway. And as you can see here, so this is how, you know, our cancer immune, immunity is generated. And there are many, many factors and, you know, um, at the, all, all, all these steps. So you can imagine not everybody uh, will respond to PD-1, pd one therapy because there's only one factor in sort of uh, step seven. So you need to have all these steps met 
uh, in order for the patient to respond to, let's say, PD-1, PD-1 therapy. So uh, there are all sorts of combination trials combining PD-1, PD-1 with, let's say, VEGF therapy, and then a CTLA-4, um, things like that. So, uh, you know, you're going to see more and more immunotherapy um, patients getting those treatment, but then uh, the future will be some sort of combination immunotherapy uh, with other drugs. And so this is showing the FDA approved checkpoint inhibitors in lung cancer. As you can see, you know, every year we have approval from FDA, uh, monotherapy, immunotherapy, or in combination with chemotherapy, or it's combination in sort of PD-1 uh, and the CTLA-4 therapy. And uh, the, the list really has been expanding pretty uh, rapidly. And the, the, the reason why we are excited by immunotherapy, I told you that briefly immunotherapy can induce a pretty durable response in, in some patients. And as you can see here, so this, these are the first immunotherapy trials in lung cancer. Uh, and at the time, the immunotherapy drugs, say nivolumab, atezolizumab, pembrolizumab, were compared with at the, at, the, at the time a standard care called vastaxel chemotherapy, and all showed the improvement in overall survival. And if you look at the tail of the curve, and there are certain patients uh, let's say, you know, 15 to 20% of patients who really don't experience death or progression. And so um, a fraction of patients can really enjoy the durable response from immunotherapy. And now first line setting for stage four lung cancer, we have uh, a lot of, um, you know, uh, regimens approved. And I don't want you to remember every details because I, I can't. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, just highlight the, um, you know, one of the most widely used drug called pembrolizumab. So pembro is a PD-1 inhibitor, again, immunotherapy wrapping up the immune system. It was compared with the chemotherapy in the first line setting in patients with the tumors, uh, you know, PD-1 expression at least 50% and showed both uh, progress and free survival and over survival benefit and leading to FDA approval of this drug. So this was remarkable because, uh, you know, you can sort of uh, think this, um, think about it this way. So, you know, up until, let's say, um, several years ago, the, the first line therapy was always chemotherapy, period. But then this really replaced the chemotherapy as a first line option. And so it was chemo free regimen and pretty durable overall survival benefit. So this was a really remarkable trial, uh, landmark trial in our field. Um, and so what it did was Pembro uh, doubled the overall survival. So with the chemotherapy first approach with, uh, for stage four lung cancer, uh, the overall survival was 14.2 months. With the Pembro first approach, and a lot of the chemotherapy first um, approach patients uh, cross over to Pembro and receive the, the Pembro, um, but despite that, uh, you know, they were able to show the overall survival. It really doubled the overall survival if you receive immunotherapy and with the high PD-1, L1 in um, sort of expression in the tumor. And so we're really remarkable. And Kino the 042 really expanded the indication of uh, Pembro to uh, PD-1 at least 1%, not 50%, but 1%. So uh, more patients could get Pembro, but then the benefit was really driven by uh, those who had high PD-1 expression. So, um, we still don't use Pembro monotherapy uh, for a patient uh, with the PD-1 expression 1 to 49%. If the patient can get the chemo immuno combination, we prefer that. And so this is a trial, uh, first line trial again, uh, comparing chemo plus Pembro versus uh, chemotherapy alone, showing pretty good separation of over survivor curves, uh, favoring the, the combination chemo and Pembro. Um, so this is an option we use a lot for our patients. Um, and so the keynote 189 was for adenocarcinoma, and this was for non-adenocarcinoma, so the advanced squamous carcinoma uh, data. Uh, same concept, chemo, pembro combination uh, versus uh, chemotherapy alone, showing pretty good uh, uh, over sort of benefit with the combination. Uh, so this is a summary of all the, all the trials, first-line setting. Uh, again, the bottom line is that the immunotherapy-based approach um, be it monotherapy or any combination of chemotherapy, really uh, outperform chemotherapy alone. So it's very rare that we start chemotherapy first uh, if you have a stage four uh, lung cancer uh, these days, unless there are certain uh, very specific case scenarios. So a lot of patients, if they don't have uh, target therapy option, they get immunotherapy based option, uh, you know, be it immunotherapy, monotherapy, or uh, in combination with chemotherapy. Um, and so uh, that is the sort of current standard practice. Uh, briefly about early stage non-small cell lung cancer um, or locally advanced, and uh, this is the data about the over survival. So if you look at the 
five year reverse survival, even if you have a stage one, uh, you know, A disease, uh, one to three, the, not everybody survives, you know, five years because, you know, the, the disease can still relapse. Uh, and if you are, if you look at stage three disease, we're talking about, you know, 12 percent to 41 percent over survival and a lot of these patients relapse even after the curative intent uh, treatment uh, but you know if you have a patient with stage one or two disease uh, you know, we always think about local therapy uh, such as surgery if that is an option we, we do that uh, if not the radiation therapy to treat and then uh, depending on their stage we give uh, adjuvant therapy like chemotherapy uh, not uh, the adjuvant chemo is not really indicated well in stage one disease, but stage two, we, we think about that. Uh, there's a strong indication for chemotherapy. And the same thing for stage three disease, we use chemotherapy after surgery for local therapy. Um, stage three disease is challenging, and this is, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time in tumor board discussing stage three patients because it can involve multiple modality surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. Um, and so can I, I think I talk about this. Uh, so chemotherapy we use after surgery, um, but then the absolute over survival benefit is about 5% you know, at five years. So it's not fantastic, it saves lives, but we don't know which patients uh, benefit from uh, asthma chemotherapy, but we still do it because we don't have the power to select who will benefit. Uh, but the you know, OS benefit is pretty, pretty modest. Uh, but things are changing. So uh, in terms of adjuvant therapy, we only had um, chemotherapy, as I mentioned, but now we have the option of doing uh, in osimertine, which is EGFR TK, I mentioned this uh, when I was talking about stage four disease with EGFR mutation. But if you have now a patient who had uh, EGFR mutation and has surgical resection, and you can uh, discuss this option with the patient. And, uh, in this trial, they used uh, three years of osimertine versus placebo and showed that pretty good disease for survival benefit of osimertine. We have to see whether the uh, over survival uh, will pan out, but then the data is still immature and that has been pre presented. Uh, I think I have two more slides. So Pacific trial. So if you have a patient with stage three non-small cell lung cancer, unresectable, that the patient usually receive a chemo radiation therapy, and then uh, this trial randomized patients either to uh, their valumab PDL1 inhibitor versus placebo. And what what they show was that there was over survival benefit with the other valumab, which is PDL1 inhibitor. So this is standard practice um, uh, to use their valumab after chemo radiation therapy. So to conclude, is there still a, a little uh, cancer with the high mortality, the leading cause of cancer that's worldwide, United States. Uh, but you know, we are seeing more options for our patients, uh, target therapy, immunotherapy. And so um, very exciting. And then you know, the first thing we do, one of the first things is to understand the stage and also molecular profiles of the tumor. So uh, that is, those two are very important. Uh, and then we are seeing the integration of target therapy and immunotherapy in earlier stage disease. Uh, and so I, we hope to improve cure rate uh, you know, for patients with um, no, no metastatic disease.